Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. This is Dylan Burroughs along with Joe Kerr, and we are coming to you from the Hope For Our Times conference in sunny Southern California with Tom Hughes. This has been a wonderful event, hasn't it, Joe, being able to meet with so many of the top prophecy teachers around our country. We have absolutely loved the environment. The energy in this place with people excited about that topic is just spectacular. I love to see that because they take it home. Yes, and right now we are here with another one of the experts at the Hope Far Times Conference. This is Dr. Andy Woods we're talking with today. He is a PhD in Bible Exposition from Dallas Theological Seminary. He is currently the president of Chafer Theological Seminary and senior pastor of Sugarland Bible Church. I'm excited this weekend because I get to hear him talk about a topic that is relevant to our church in more ways than most of you are aware, this idea of replacement theology. We're going to talk about what it is, why it's a danger, and what we can do about it. Welcome to the show, Dr. Andy Woods. Hey guys, it's good to be back with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, and like I mentioned, we'll be talking about replacement theology, and people are probably wondering in many cases what that even is, why this is a concern, why I should even care about it. So let's start at the beginning. Define it for us. Well, replacement theology, I think, is the dominant view that's been taught in Christendom over the last 2,000 years. And it really goes back to the City of God, a book that Augustine wrote. And basically, that was the first formal treatment of it all the way back to the 4th century. And basically, the idea is that God has severed his promises with national Israel. All of Israel's promises have been transferred over to the church through a kind of a spiritualized method of interpretation. Now, it's interesting, they never transfer the curses to the church. Yeah, they still get to keep all the curses. <laughs> the, yeah, Jew, the nation of Israel will keep the curses behind with the Jewish people, but the blessings are are the churches. Therefore, the church is the new Israel. Therefore, as far as a future for the nation of Israel, uh, God is finished with the nation of Israel. And kind of a fancy name for this is supersessionism. And that's just a fancy word for meaning the church has now superseded the place of Israel. So where the main act is the church, and there is no future purpose for national Israel. We like to focus on the church, obviously, with being focusing on watchmen. The watchmen are, in many cases, prominent servants in their church because they follow and track the word of God, and they interpret current events in light of Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. They tend to be kind of that default apologist in their congregation in many cases. What can they do with this idea of replacement theology? How does a watchman need to approach that subject in their everyday church? Well, I think probably the first thing to do is to communicate to people that this is not just a pie-in-the-sky discussion. I mean, this is very practical. And the reason it's practical is it goes directly to the character of God. In other words, if God can sever the covenant that he made with Israel and what we call the Abrahamic covenant— then what is God? He's sort of one of these uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, type of gods that's very deceptive. Doesn't mean what he says and says what he means. Uh, he can transfer his, his promises from one group to another willy-nilly. He's not really bound by anything. And the problem is the Bible in Hebrews 6, verse 18, Titus 1, verse 2, Numbers 23, verse 19, they all say it's impossible for God to lie. So if replacement theology is true, it goes to the character of God. And if God's character is somehow on trial here, then what does that say to the promises that he's made to me as a Gentile Christian? You know, for example, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Romans 8, verses 38 and following what do I do with that promise? It really doesn't mean much because he's, after all, broken his word to the on the Abrahamic covenant. So that's why chapter 8, where my promises is found, is followed by Romans 9 through 11, which says God is going to keep every single promise he's ever made to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. To me, that's a happy thing because if he's faithful to Israel, he's going to be faithful to me at the end of Romans 8. So that's why this is such a practical thing. And the watchmen out there, you know, just need to communicate that this is not just a theological 
discussion by eggheads, you know, this deals directly with the character of God. Right. And as we talk about replacement theology, you begin to see some of the dangers involved with this. And one, as you've alluded to already, is how we interpret scripture. Talk a little bit about how replacement theology affects the way we interpret the Bible. Well, the replacement theologian has bought into a hermeneutic, that means interpretation, that the New Testament changes the old. And we even have, you know, mainline very popular uh, pastors today saying that God has is now unhinged or unhitched, you know, from the Old Testament. That's basically replacement theology. The New Testament has re-altered the Old. And so you understand the Old Testament by what's revealed in the New Testament. And we don't believe that. Uh, we believe that God is going to keep every single promise that he has ever made all the way through the Old Testament age and you interpret the New Testament in light of what God has already revealed in the Old Testament. And so that's the fundamental difference. The replacement theologian thinks the New Testament changes the Old Testament, and we don't believe that. Right. Well, it also has ramification for how we interpret the end times. Seek a little bit to that idea that a replacement theology does change how we view what happens in the end. Well, for example, we're talking in this conference about the reborn state of Israel. To the replacement theologian, that's just a fluke. It doesn't really matter. It's not something to pay attention to. They move into this idea that Israel is just a tiny country that only survives because of America's shipments and things like that. So your your replacement theologian looks at Israel and says Israel is irrelevant. It's nice to support Israel, but there's no theological meaning to the Jews being regathered. And that relates to their idea that the New Testament has altered the old and God has severed his promises to Israel. But to us, as we read the Old Testament, we believe there's a lot of commitments that God has made to Israel which have never been elapsed. So when we see the Jews being regathered to their homeland after 2,000 years in the diaspora or the dispersion, to us it's very, very exciting because God is getting ready to, you know, make good on everything he's ever said related to Israel. So, you know, you can tell you're dealing with a replacement theologian just based on how they're looking at the end times or the modern state of Israel. Yes, well, that's a good way to put it. One way to figure out if the person is supportive of replacement theology is to ask them of their view of Israel, especially modern Israel today. And when we come back, we want to talk more about how this impacts our lives individually as well as our churches today. For example, is replacement theology in some way anti-Semitic? We'll talk about this more when we come back on A View from the Wall. Stick with us. From I Am A Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am A Watchman Minute. About 3,000 years ago, a young David stepped out on the battlefield to face the mighty giant Goliath. The epic battle has become well known inside and outside the church. What's amazing to me about this story is not David's aim, but his faith. It was precisely because his faith was greater than his fear that David had the victory. Now, when your problem is great and it seems like a giant is in your path, what do you see? A giant that's a problem that's too big to overcome? Or are you like David and see a giant that's a target that's too big to miss? Have faith. Strive to see things through eyes of faith. And remember, the I'm a Watchman ministry is here to help you grow and be the overcomer that God wants you to be. Be bold. Be faithful. Be a Watchman. Iamawatchman.com Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan and Joe. We're here talking with Dr. Andy Woods about concerns regarding replacement theology. And as we continue the Whole Far Times conference, we have seen a great turnout in terms of support for the Jewish people, the modern state of Israel, for example, many references to Messianic Judaism and how God is working among Jewish people still today. But as we talk about this concept of replacement theology, it does impact our treatment of the Jewish people in the modern state of Israel. Talk to that a little bit. How does that uh, change the way that we look at the Jewish people and our treatment of the Jewish people in modern Israel? Well, I mean, the way I see it is from a grid of Romans 15, I think it's around verse 26, 27, you know, where Paul is raising money, basically, for the saints in Jerusalem. And he says to the Gentiles, you're obligated to help them materially 
Because after all, you wouldn't have anything spiritually had it not been for God's work through the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And people say, well, how can you do that? There are a bunch of unbelievers, but um, guess what you have to be before you can be a believer? (laughs) You have to be an unbeliever. Exactly. I mean, was God not at work in all of our lives before we got saved? Well, why can't that be true of a nation regathered from the four corners of the earth in unbelief? And so Paul, I think it's in Romans 11, around verses 28 and 29, says, currently they're your opponents or enemies, because they were the ones trying to frustrate the gospel in the book of Acts. But then he says in that same, those same verses, they're beloved on the part of the patriarchs. So we kind of look at Israel as an unfinished project, and that's why it's easy to love them, to bless them, to support them, because God is just getting ready to work in and through them, but we don't see the end product yet, but we see it through the eyes of faith talked about some of the dangers of replacement theology and defined very well what that is. So if we want to avoid replacement theology and all of the damage to Israel that that can cause, as well as the way it crushes the gospel in the church, what should we be What should we be doing? What's the opposite of replacement theology? Well, the, the opposite of replacement theology is basically this idea that God has made certain commitments to Israel. And it becomes very clear as you systematically move through the Old Testament. Now in Acts 2, because of the nation's rejection of her Messiah and Israel's unbelief, God moved in with his great purpose of creating the church. Uh, The church has always been part of the preordained plan of God. Ephesians 3, I think around verse 11, talks about that. But what is the church? Is the church the new Israel? Is the church a replacement for Israel? No, the church is an interruption in God's past work and future work with Israel. Kind of the fancy name, I think it was Lewis Berry Chafer that came up with this uh, uh, term. He called it an intercalation, which means an interruption. And that's what we are. Uh, God is clearly at work through the church. Praise the Lord. The work of the church has been going on for the last 2,000 years. We don't know how much longer it's going to continue. It could end tomorrow. It could go on for another 150 years or even longer. But we never begin to look at the church as some kind of a replacement of Israel. It's an interruption in God's past work and future work with Israel. Well, that's a good way to put it. And I think, again, of Romans 1, 16, where the gospel's for the Jew first and then the Gentiles. So it's not one or the other. It's one and the other that God has called us to do. Amen. Let's transition a little bit. I know that as president of Chafer Theological Seminary, you have many distinctives regarding Bible prophecy and what you believe is important to emphasize in that regard to avoid some of these concerns, such as replacement theology. Talk a little bit about some of those distinctives and why you believe they are important for believers today. Well, probably the most important distinctive, and people want to look at this in any Bible college they go to, is do the teachers there hold to a consistent, literal approach to the Bible? Because all of Christendom, at some point, has to be literal somewhere, or they'd be full-fledged liberals. Uh, The issue isn't selective literalism, it's consistent literalism applied from Genesis to Revelation. And we believe that when you apply that method, taking into consideration figures of speech, when they're conspicuous or obvious in the text, it leads you in the direction of young earth creationism, Genesis 1 through 11. It leads you in the direction of dispensationalism, that the church is not a replacement for Israel, as we tried to explain a little earlier. And it leads in the direction of premillennialism, that God has a future kingdom in mind, That'll be very is Israelitish in tone, where Israel is going to be elevated again over the head of the nations. And so your theology is really born out of your desire to apply the right method, which is the foundational stone of a consistent literal approach to the Bible. And so... We get our conclusions from a consistent application of that method, if that helps. No, that is great. And I want to talk a little bit more about this theme that you mentioned of dispensationalism. It is an important concept when it comes to Bible prophecy, but most people don't even know what dispensationalism is or even what to do with it once they do know what it is. Speak to that just for a moment. 
Well, we believe dispensationalism is not something read into the Bible. It's something that naturally flows out of a consistent literal approach to the whole Bible. And when you kind of step back and look at the whole Bible, God changes the house rules about seven times. That's what the word dispensation means. It comes from uh, the Greek word that Paul uses in Ephesians. And basically that word means house rules. It comes from the Greek oikonomia. Oikos meaning house, namos meaning law or rules. And God changes the rules. The plan of salvation never changes. But as you go through the Bible, it's very obvious. You get to Genesis 3 with the fall of man. And the ground becomes cursed and pregnancy becomes difficult and all these things. Obviously, the rules change there. So a traditional dispensationalist like myself would see about seven places where the rules change. And when you start to understand that, you start to understand that the church is the church and not Israel. And God has a future program in mind for Israel. So hopefully that helps a little bit. You talked about our view of God and how that's interpreted by all of the things that we talked about. Mm -hmm. I used to serve a God who was hateful and wicked and evil and lied, but I got saved and Mm -hmm. I don't serve that God anymore. Mm -hmm. And what we see of God in scripture is a completely different God. What is he like? Well, Jesus said that we're to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. God has many, many attributes. One of them is holiness. Uh, Another one is love. God is love. And how do those two attributes come together? Well, they come together in the cross because at the cross, the justice of God was satisfied as one member of the Trinity, God the Father, poured out his wrath on another member of the Trinity, God the Son, for the sins that we've done as members of Adam's rebellious race. But at the same time, the grace of God is there because now judgment doesn't have to be poured out on us if we fulfill the condition of trusting in what Jesus has done in our place. So, you know, he's a God of holiness and love, and the two come together perfectly in what we call the crucifixion or the atoning death of Christ. Well, that is a great word to conclude on for the second segment. We'll be right back with more on A View from the Wall. Stick with us. A View from the Wall comes from I Am a Watchman Ministries, established to help individuals know the love of Jesus, enter into a relationship with Jesus, live for Jesus, tell others about Jesus, and prepare for the imminent return of Jesus. We want to inspire the body to live a life of meaning and purpose. And at the coming judgment, hear the Lord say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. The wise will strive to live well so that they can finish well. The prudent will work to be aware of what God has done and what prophecy notes he will do in the days to come. In support of these goals, the I Am A Watchman ministry is happy to make available at no cost a wealth of discipleship, prophecy, and spiritual growth resources for those who desire to learn and those who are called to lead. Find out more by visiting our website, IamAWatchman.com. That's IamAWatchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan Burroughs with Joe Kerr, and we've been enjoying our conversation today at the Hope Our Times Conference with Dr. Andy Woods. We've talked about concerns with replacement theology and why it's important to make those distinctions between Israel and the church. And in this final segment, we want to talk a little bit about what happens in Bible prophecy. If you take this view that the pre-tribulation is the correct view, that the rapture can happen at any moment, and then the rest happens, what is that rest? Let's talk a little bit about that chronology. So the Bible talks about Jesus will come back at any moment. That's in John 14. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. That's in 1 Thessalonians 4. What happens after the rapture in the Bible that we had to look forward to in Scripture? Well, you know, following the rapture of the church for the Christian, uh, Paul says absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so there's basically a reunion in the sky between living believers of the church age at the time and those that have passed on over the last 2,000 years. And all of us are placed in resurrected bodies at that point. And while we're in heaven with the Lord in the Father's house for seven years, we experience something called the Bema Seat, Judgment of Christ, which is not a judgment to determine heaven or hell, 
that issue already got resolved the moment we placed our personal faith in Christ for salvation. But it's really a judgment to determine how we spend our lives in Christ. Did we go back to carnality or did we allow the Lord to express himself through us and create eternal fruit? And we're basically given rewards or not given rewards based on how we lived for Christ in the, the you know, in our Christian lives. But during, while all that's happening in heaven, on the earth at the time, there'll be a peace treaty between unbelieving Israel and the Antichrist. And then you move into the book of Revelation where three sets of terrible judgments are described, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the golden bowl of wrath judgments, and God's wrath is being poured out on the earth dwellers and unbelievers at that time. But at the same time, God is at work with Israel, and tiny Israel is coming to faith, I would guess, in the second half of the tribulation period. The gospel is being preached by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists as the first fruits during this time period. There's two Jewish witnesses that are proclaiming truth during this time period. There's actually an angel, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, flying to and fro, giving forth the eternal gospel. So it's a time of terrible judgment that the church will not be in. But it's also a remarkable time of many, many salvations. In fact, the people saved during that time period are so numerous, they can't even be counted. And that terrible time period ends with the second advent of Christ, where he returns. This is not the rapture. The rapture's already happened seven plus years earlier, but he returns and his feet touch the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, around verse 4, the Mount of Olives splits. And he sets up his glorious thousand-year kingdom, And only those that are saved during the tribulation period will enter that kingdom in their mortal bodies. The rest will be purged off the earth and cast into Hades. And we as the church, already in resurrected bodies, are there ruling and reigning alongside Christ. Not that he needs our help, but it's the privilege that we have in him. And the thousand years unfold. Amongst the mortals, there's kind of a rebellion at the end of that thousand-year time period as Satan is released from his abyss for a very short season. But when you read about that in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, uh, the rebellion is quickly quelled. And at that point in time, you'll have the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And that's a judgment only for unbelievers of all ages as their name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life. They're thrown into the lake of fire forever. And then I think what happens after that, Second Peter 3, verse 10, Revelation 21, verse 1, is this present world is dissolved by fire. People say, do you believe in global warming? Well, over there, I, I do believe in it. <laughs> it's dissolved by fire, and God replaces it with a glorious new heavens and new earth, and that's our eternal abode in that eternal city called the New Jerusalem. So the story of the Bible is from a garden to a city uh, with a cross in between. So we have a lot to look forward to. You've been on the program before, so you know how we like to end this. With all of that message and all of the chaos that we see going on around us, watchmen are always focused on those few things, watch, warn, witness, and finish well. Feels a lot more like it's all about finish well right now. Give a word of encouragement and challenge to those watchmen as they finish well. Well, the only thing that really keeps us going and motivated is hope. If you just look at the bad, and there's plenty to look at, uh, you're just going to become very depressed and despondent. But God's word is such that he gives us the reality of negativity, but it's tempered by hope. And many of the things that we talked about earlier deal with that hope and That's what the rapture is. It's our blessed hope. And so I would just encourage people as watchmen not to focus exclusively on the signs of the times. Keep watching those, of course, but temper it with the rest of God's word, which makes us at the end of the day, not pessimillennialists as we're sometimes accused of, but flaming optimists. Yeah, so this has been a fascinating conversation. I know for some of those who are listening, they want to know more about your ministry or about the seminary you lead. Tell us a little bit about how to get more information. Yeah, if you're interested in seminary training, uh, we can help you with that. Just go to www.chafer.edu. And if people are interested in some of my verse-by-verse 
studies and topical studies I've done, they can go to Sugarland Bible Church. We've got a sermon archive there, www.slbc.org. An awful lot of people are listening to us on YouTube. And so you can find my YouTube channel. Just type in Andy Woods and pastor's point of view into your YouTube search engine and sign up for that. That's all free. And we load up stuff there, regular teaching consistently. Yes. Well, I would encourage you to do that. I've been blessed personally by watching some of these videos as well. So I know these can be a benefit to you. As we wrap up our time with Dr. Andy Woods today, I just want to encourage those of you who are listening to very seriously take this to heart. Replacement theology is not just a trend or some passing fad. This is something that can change the way people look at God's word, how they live their lives and following God. So it's important that you be aware of it, that you speak out against it, and you do your part to live out your faith according to God's word, rightly interpreted as we've talked about here on A View from the Wall. Joe, we have just a moment left. Uh, kind of give an encouraging word of yourself to our audience who may be listening today and just wanting to know, how do I apply this to my life right now? There are times where everything looks like it's falling apart. And we've heard some of our other guests talk about that. It looks like everything's falling apart, but it's really all coming together. There's a plan and you address that. And God's plan has started at the beginning. It will finish at the end. And he hasn't missed anything in between. There's never been a single moment where he went, oh, wait, I wasn't ready for that. It's a plan. It's on track. We know where it's headed. And we have, your words, a blessed hope. It's fantastic. Amen. Thanks again, Dr. Andy Woods, for joining us here on A View from the Wall. Stick with us. We look forward to hearing from you next time on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.